The Dharma is, is something that becomes a personal thing for each one of us and is expressed through our abilities and our vision and our own particular skill. Hello and welcome to Jack Hornfield's Heart Wisdom Hour here on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network. I'm Ganesh Braymiller, welcoming you to episode 208, Way of the Bodhisattva. Now, Jack has allowed me to spelunk a little further to dive deeper into the Cornfield archives and pull up some really cool recordings that have never been heard before. This one takes place at Camp Cedar Glen, California, during a two-week meditation retreat Jack was teaching. This is on April 10th, 1977, and is one of the farthest back recordings that we have to date. In this episode, he speaks of beautiful beings of compassion who have inspired him throughout the years, and I hope that the stories that he shares inspire you. So before getting into the bulk of the episode, I do want to share with you the amazing offerings Jack has coming up. After a relatively slow summer, Jack has a lot of beautiful offerings for you this autumn. Starting October 16th, Jack is leading a mindfulness mentor training online with Tara Brock. It is 16 weeks and is presented by Cloud Sangha. This will not only help you deepen your own meditation practice, but also give you the skills and perspective to be able to apply mindfulness as a vocation in your world and reality to help people and help yourself. Then on that same day, October 16th, Jack is back for his Spirit Rock Monday night Dharma talk and meditation. This is live, it is pay what you can, and it is truly a staple. He has been doing this for years. Uh, decades actually, and it's really amazing each month to uh, step in and see what is flowing through Jack's wisdom stream. And then on October 20th, Jack is part of Dr. Diana Hill's Wise Effort Together. He is doing a session with Trudy Goodman online called Loving Effort, Moving with Joy and Benevolence Through the World. This is a free gathering and the full three-day event contains many teachers and a whole lot of wisdom. And then the last one we'll share today is loving presence, compassion, and a joyful heart. This is something Jack is doing with Trudy Goodman as a day-long retreat and benefit for Spirit Rock Meditation Center. So there we have it, fam. Just wanted to thank you for always being here and opening yourself to these teachings. Here is a vintage episode of Jack Cornfield from 1977, The Way of the Bodhisattva. May you be happy, may you be healthy, may you help others through the authenticity of your own being, and may your heart always be smiling. Namaste. The past two evenings, a great deal has been said about suffering and pain in the world perhaps quite appropriate for Good Friday and the Saturday that follows. Today is Easter Sunday. It seems equally appropriate and important to look at the other side of practice, relation to the world. I'd like to do that first by talking about certain people that I have met or with whom I've had contact recently have been particularly inspiring to me just to share that space with you to talk further after that. First person who comes to mind when I think of the positive light qualities that come through spiritual understanding. It's a woman named Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Some of you may know of her work, others perhaps not. 
She is a Yugoslavian woman, saint, who currently lives in Calcutta and has taught there for many years and for the last 20 or 30 years has been working with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, starting herself with nothing, just leaving, walking onto the streets with about 50 cents and seeing the first person who was dying on the streets, picking that person up and looking for a place to take care of them. Had the honor of being guided in this last trip to Asia by several of her most senior nuns to the places where her work is taking place in Calcutta, and also to have seen an excellent film of her speaking about her work last year. She's asked about her work. She says some things to share with you. Talked about picking up these people from the streets of Calcutta, some of whom are starving, some of whom are bitten by rats incapacitated, unable to take care of themselves, said, well, why, why should you bother to bring them, bring them here? They're just going to die anyway, probably. Her first response was that even if they've lived at times like animals, if you give them the space and love, they can die like angels. She went on, <clears throat> on being questioned. One said, well, the work you do is very beautiful, but you pick up a few hundred people in the course of a week or two and take care of them, and there's such a mass of suffering in India. Don't you think it would be more helpful to get worldwide grants and a great number of social workers and people to really alleviate the problem on a mass scale? She said that for her, it wasn't a problem for social workers said that the greatest problem in the world, greatest disease, is not cancer or leprosy or tuberculosis, for which there are either cures or some kinds of medicines that aid in the relief of that suffering, but the suffering of loneliness, of being someone who is unloved. Said, and social workers said, try to solve a problem. And for her, the task, the problem really was to provide love for people. That was the essence of her work. Very beautiful also to go into her place. She has places where she provides work for people when they have become rehabilitated, those who don't die. She has a place where they take care of little babies. In Calcutta, again, because it's crowded and poor, there are babies that are born that are unwanted and often they're thrown away, literally in the trash or the street, and people now know in Calcutta if they see them, pick them up and bring them to her. And it's a most extraordinary sight to see a whole ward, first the ward where the new babies come in who are sickly and crying and frail, and then a whole ward filled with the most light, bright, joyful faces of children who have been revived and taken care of and well-fed by her and the people that work with her. So much love going to the children and so much love that's reflected in their faces. What's particularly extraordinary about the scene of Mother Teresa is that it takes place in an environment of perhaps some of the greatest physical suffering that there is on the earth for our human beings, the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. And in the midst of that incredible suffering is the greatest light to see her and to see the people that work with her is to experience how insignificant even is that physical suffering compared to the light that can come from compassion and caring and kindness love in even that situation. When we went into her place, there was a sign on the bulletin board, it was a blackboard rather, written in chalk. It was the saying for the day, Mother Teresa had said. The saying of the day was, better to make mistakes with kindness than to perform miracles without love in your heart. 
one point the interviewee, interviewer was talking to her and in a kind of teasing way asked her if she was married. She said, London wears a habit which is a sari, her order of missionaries of charity. And she said, oh yes, indeed she was married and showed her ring which signified the marriage to Christ of, of a nun, symbolically. And she paused for a minute and then she said, and he can be very difficult. <laughs> Marriage on any level. Very, very beautiful to see her acknowledging that not only is it a beautiful and completely fulfilling path, but also one that includes difficulties and trials. Most extraordinary woman, uh, it's hard for me to convey in words the power of even seeing a film about her, much less to see the work that she done. Another person particularly inspiring to me it's a woman who has very much the same quality about her, although she is working in this country. The same quality of, of unshakable compassion, just bottomless, unfathomable, is a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, again, who many of you may have heard of. She works with particularly people who are on their deathbed and has written some well-known books, the first of which on death and dying, details the stages that people typically go through around the time of death. First of denial, not me, I'm not going to die, so it must be a mistake, take that test over again, doctor. And then the level of anger, why should it be me, why should it happen to me? And then a stage of what she calls bargaining, if I'm this good, can I have another day? Can I have another week? Can I have a little longer? I'll do this, I'll do your work, I will this, I will that. And then the stage of real grief and grieving, separation and feeling that, and finally of acceptance. I had the honor of spending quite a bit of time with her last year. One of the first things that she said in talking about how her work and understanding has grown is that it's as soon as she understood the, the stages that people typically went through on deathbed, said that it was necessary for her to unlearn them. What she meant was that to have an idea of how someone should die, that they should get through their anger and get to acceptance before they die, or that they should get through their grief and get to acceptance before they die, was again not really knowing how to love them fully. Because to love them fully was to accept them just as they were and to let them flower and unfold and die in their own natural way. So she said some people will die raging and some will die denying, some will die with acceptance. And the task of someone who's working with someone on a deathbed is not to make them see anything or get to anywhere, but just to provide a space for them to be how they are. Said, when you're with, sitting with somebody on their deathbed, said, you can't play games. You can't, you know, talk about who you are or things in the world, power or fame or money. Totally uninteresting. Can't be insincere because people don't have time. They're not interested. Only to just be there in a really honest and full way. And so her message is really one of acceptance, very, very deep one, compassion. She's an enormously creative and courageous woman. In recent years, she's been working with a number of people who have had near-death experiences in which they left their physical body and were declared clinically dead and then returned to life. This happens in hospitals. And through talking to many of her patients has gotten a kind of an outline of what common experiences are around the time of death after leaving the body. Is now teaching this to people who are dying in a way that may get her crucified almost from the scientific and medical profession. 
and yet she listens to her inner voice and vision and shares that. Tell you one story of her just to illustrate her skill and her, her love. Currently, the last two years, she's mostly been working with children who are dying, cancer, leukemia, things like that, can't be cured for the most part. She said working with dying children, usually in their home, is really both joyful and difficult. Difficult not so much because it's hard for children to die, because they, she said they seem to have a natural understanding and they don't have a lot of concepts and fears on top of it. Great difficulty is often the family and the scene surrounding them. There was this one child, young girl who was dying of cancer. She had been close to her for a period of time prior to the final deathbed experience. The child was there lying on the deathbed, very, very ill, and yet unable to die. Elizabeth came in to sit with her and said, what's the matter? You know, she realized her parents had let go and were accepting the death of the child, most of the people around, and yet the child was holding on and would not die. She said, what's the matter? How come you can't let go? How come you can't die? And the child said, I can't die. Elizabeth said, Why? The child said, because I won't go to heaven. And Elizabeth said at that point, it was hard for her to, to control her anger. She said, who told you that? She said, the priest told me. He said that if I don't love God more than anyone else in the whole world, I won't go to heaven. And she paused and she said, I love mommy and daddy more than anyone else in the whole world. Elizabeth said in this work, you can't try and change anyone. You can't change a priest who's been teaching for so many years or the parents. Said, so how to work skillfully with the situation without contradicting or creating difficulty? What would you do? Said, this girl is about 12 years old, I believe. Said, you know, do you remember last fall when you couldn't go to school and the day that school started and how you felt? The girl remembered it. it had been one of the most difficult and sad days of her life when she realized that she would never again be able to go to school with the other children, participate. She remembered it. Said, and do you remember last year when you were in school in your class? This was a very bright girl. Remember your teacher used to give out special assignments? The girl said, yes. He said, she only gave those assignments to the very best students, to the students who she loved the most and she, who she knew could work the hardest. And the girl smiled and acknowledged that, knowing that she was one of that group. And then Elizabeth asked her, she said, tell me something. For you as a child... Do you think that God has given you an easy or a hard assignment? And the little girl smiled and she said, looking down at her body, which the stomach was bloated and the limbs were just skin and bones, she said, a very, very difficult assignment, but understood that it was through love and not through, not through anything else. And after that was able to die, with a great deal of peace. To listen to Elizabeth tell stories is <clears throat> awesome. It's staggering. The depth of her compassion and wisdom and her ability to be with people in a really honest and skillful way. People ask sometimes, isn't meditation kind of selfish? All these people in the world to help could go and work with Mother Teresa or Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Tell another story. This is sort of in regards to one of my teachers, Ajahn Chah, and the monastery that he's created. When I was practicing there, it was still during the war in Southeast Asia. And 
In the mornings, the monks would go out. We would all go out with our begging bowls and walk on these little narrow paths between the rice paddies in the rainy season to go to one of the nearby villages and collect alms food. I remember particularly one morning walking out, although this happened on many, beautiful rice paddies, little fog, very simple villages, could have been 2,000 years ago, no cars, just, just houses of wood and bamboo and water buffaloes. Really exquisite. And seeing overhead the, a fair number of B-52 bombers which were flying back from Vietnam to the air bases in Thailand, Ajahn Chao's monastery is relatively close to both the Lao and Cambodian border. So close that when the war in Cambodia started at night, you couldn't see the flashes from the bombs in Cambodia. And pretty close to Laos also, you could hear the bombing sometime from Laos, not see it so well. I had a couple of good friends at that time who were working in Vietnam uh, and Laos, one fellow, Fred Brockman, who was the head of Project Air War to stop the bombing, worked closely with the Kennedy's committee in the Senate and with the Pat Dat Lao and the North Vietnamese. And they came to visit me, another friend who was in the Quaker groups in Vietnam. And at first their reaction was, what are you doing here sitting on your ass on a cushion when the war is happening around? Why don't you do something? And after a couple of visits and some time together, they began to understand, understand the diversity of paths. Their work was exquisite. They were working, and not in a particularly egocentric or well-known way, but jeopardizing their lives to help end the bombing, which was almost of unspeakable horror. People bomb each other. It's incredible. At the same time, not so far from Ajahn Chah's monastery, right over the border in Cambodia and the border in Laos, and there was traffic back and forth through this province in Thailand, was the war. And if any of you have not visited a war, many of you have and probably, it can't be described what happens to people. The most kind of deep-seated fears which then allow people to steal, to kill, to do things that you wouldn't expect so many people to do. Just the turmoil of that kind of society at that time. Horrible and, and extraordinary. Haichun Chao's monastery, and it's really even visually so in the rainy season, is 200 acres of forest with little cottages scattered in it and a main meditation hall and dining hall for the monks on one side and nuns on the other. It's like an island of peace in the middle of a very troubled area of the world. The monks from that monastery went out and got directly involved in the political troubles. It wouldn't last very long, the monastery as it is. But instead, it's possible to walk in that monastery and have it be like a living library, a living example of age-old, of ageless wisdom and of a possibility. You could walk in and leave something very valuable in the middle of the monastery on the ground and not a single monk would touch it, wouldn't go anywhere, it would just sit there. The basis for the relations in that community is love and consciousness, trying to learn to become aware, to be helpful for each other. And so it's like, it's like a preserved example of what the most, the highest human values are in practice, not just talked about, but put into practice. And many villagers would come and visit that and be inspired and go back and practice. And the monks would sometimes go out and teach, but not involved in the politics of it. And my friends saw that there are a lot of ways in which a being can express their compassion in the world and express the Dharma. The Dharma is, is something that becomes a personal thing for each one of us as it, as it, and is expressed through our 
abilities and our vision and our own particular skill. It was a very beautiful thing to see how that which seemed apart was in fact so important for the preservation of that which is which is really the essence of human life. To break down models a little more, two short stories. One of them is about Richard's teacher, also whom I've learned from, Sung San, who is a very great Zen Roshi. Wonderful, delightful, full of energy and vigor and joy and funny and incredibly direct and helpful in teaching. He's the patriarch of Korea, the most, the, uh, most famous Zen master of the Korean Zen tradition. He came to this country, met some Zen teachers, as I've told the story in California, and then went to travel and gave a series of talks in certain places where he was invited, and like this country, decided to stay here. He gave a talk in Providence at Brown University, like the town of Providence, and not having anywhere else to go, decided that he would stay there. Not having students at the time, although he'd given a talk and a few people were interested, he went out to get a job. And he ended up as a man who took care of a laundromat. <laughs> he was in the laundromat and he would put quarters in the machines and make sure when washing machines got stuck, they were unstuck. He did this for almost a year. You go into your corridor laundromat, and there's this man wearing a funny gray robe with shaven head, sort of jolly, who put quarters in your washing <laughs> fountain. And he just did that. And at some point, a few people in the neighborhood figured out who this guy was, and they asked him if he would begin to teach them. And he said, certainly. And s several didn't really have a place to live around there, so he let them stay in his apartment and he continued to work at the laundromat to support the apartment. Finally, they decided that they should let him teach full time and they would support the apartment and, and they would go to work instead of him. Mm. Interestingly enough, Providence is a funny town. There were two llamas who were living in western Massachusetts, not far from the center in Barrie. A um, couple of years ago, one of them has gone back to Tibet uh, to, to India, rather, and the other is still living in this country, Lama Jigse, both of whom are both highly educated scholars, Geshe's, the highest level of Tibetan religious scholarship, and also meditation masters. And the younger one, after his elder, elder companion, Lama, went back to India, didn't have many students at the time, and so... He too ended up in Providence, which is sort of near nearby this place in western Massachusetts and needed to find a job. He's still there, actually. Um, he works as a dishwasher in a restaurant. He doesn't speak such good English, and many of the people he works with, it's a big restaurant, are Puerto Ricans from New York City, and they speak about the same level of English, and apparently he's very happy there learning English with them and learning to work with them and, and washing dishes. I tell these two stories just to remind you again that there is no need for any model of if you're going to help the world and teach no matter what your depth of wisdom and understanding is of how you have to do it. And it's really, again, a most inspiring, almost awesome thing to see that level of unattachment to self-image and self-importance to allow someone like the patriarch of Korea, to go work in a laundromat. You think of it for yourself, who, do you, who you think you are, and whether you could be happy working in a laundromat for a year. Uh, the power that a human being has who is really committed to truth and who's really committed to love, to transform people around them is awesome. It's quite remarkable. And someone again like Mother Teresa or Ajahn Chah, who now, he sat down in the forest, Ajahn Chah, 
near where he'd grown up. And it was a place no one used to go because there were supposed to be lots of ghosts and tigers. And without particularly doing anything, not only this whole monastery, but now 30 branch monasteries have happened kind of around him. He hasn't had to do anything to make it happen. It's just done. Someone like Mother Teresa, not so much by the total count of heads of people that she's helped individually, but the force of her inspiration through her film, through books and TV things about her, through just knowing that such a being exists, has such a power to transform how we view what human life is about and what's possible for us. Now, this is from Mayor Baba. Love has to spring spontaneously from within, and it is in no way amenable to any form of inner or outer force. Love and coercion can never go together, but though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened in them through love itself. Love is essentially self-communicative. Those who do not have it catch it from those who have it. True love is unconquerable and irresistible, and it goes on gathering power and spreading itself until eventually it transforms everyone whom it touches. As you grow in practice and your vision, your understanding of the meaning of life gets deeper, you can see that the earth is not just a place of sorrow and struggle, which there is a great deal of, but you can see it as a place to learn, to love, to learn compassion, to grow. In the vision of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who talks about she also has had, in her experience, recently much contact with spirit guides. Some people think she's crazy. I don't quite think so. Understanding how our life and our situation is like a school, like a kindergarten, perhaps, for us to learn some very basic lessons. This time, each time. It becomes rather than a place to gratify our desires and see what we can get, caught in our little personal world of whether we can make it comfortable for a little while, becomes a place where there's energy to really find the truth. What is this about? An energy to really help others to that same understanding. Come to a vision to seek that which is the absolute, which is timeless, which is beyond the limited boundaries of my job and my apartment and my plants and my car and my relationship. And that, that has the power to transform, transform life. Many symbols for it. The Buddha is a symbol. Christ is a symbol. How in the midst of the greatest suffering can come the greatest understanding to remind us of the possibilities of what life can be about. In the Buddhist tradition, it's called the way of the bodhisattva. And actually, anyone who undertakes spiritual practice becomes a bodhisattva, one who is destined for Buddhahood. path of the bodhisattva isn't always easy. People think, well, I'll come to a retreat and I'll get high. It'll be easy. Huh. <laughs> it's hard, you know that. Actually, there are few people in the world who would even do what you've done so far. Really few who would subject themselves to this discipline and this difficulty, not being able to run away from the mind, from the body. That's very beautiful to see, the effort and the energy of the group. Difficult. There's a very beautiful Christian text that was given to me by a friend the last year about the desert fathers, the Christian desert fathers who practiced in Egypt in the third and fourth century. And it talks about the difficulties that beset one in practice on the desert. Go out and using a very allegorical language, a Christian language, 
They talk about being beset by demons. First, there are the demons of lust and the demons of anger, the really coarse demons who come up charging in front of you. Okay? It's interesting because different clans of demons don't get along with other demons. So when the demons of lust are there, the demons of anger can't be because when you're trying to get, you can't be pushing away. At the same time, only when the demons of lust disappear, then the demons of anger appear. Well, when the very spectacular demons in front of you disappear, then that makes space for a whole more subtle clan of demons to arise that come up from behind. And these are the demons of pride. Ah, it's getting quiet. I'm getting good. Uh -huh. It must be working. <laughs> and they use a very different language to describe very familiar experiences. Because all of us as humans share the same predicament, the same elements of mind and body. The same lessons. And it's hard. It's not easy. But it's worth it. It's really important. See in your practice as you look. Look at the demons that arise. We talk about compassion and love and equanimity. Just give you something to look for. The near enemy of compassion is pity. And it sort of comes in the guise of compassion. It's disguised. Pity. But it's not really. It's pity is when you're separating and feeling that person is different than you and feel sorry for them. Compassion is when you see Jesus, it hurts them like it hurts me. It's the same thing, and you feel that direct connection. The near enemy of love is attachment. Oh, I love this so much. I hope it doesn't go away or change. The near enemy of equanimity is indifference. Very great difference between indifference and equanimity. Indifference, again, is not being moved by something by cutting yourself off. And equanimity is allowing yourself to be there fully and totally and still feeling it, and yet being in balance. Suzuki Roshi says, even if the sun should arise in the west, the bodhisattva has only one way. What this means is that no matter what the circumstances in the world or in the universe are that change, the earth will change, the galaxies will change, the sun may go out. The path of spiritual practice, the path of a bodhisattva that we're all on, is always the same path. And it's going from small vision, from I, me, mine, to a larger and larger, more spacious, deeper understanding of the world. It's going from selfishness to unselfishness. No matter what else changes, this is so. When I first went to be with Ajahn Chah in the forest, met him at this mountain monastery, and he said to me, one of the first things he said, well, I hope you're not afraid to suffer. And I kind of looked at him and I said, I didn't come here to suffer. I came here to learn meditation and to, you know, be a monk and whatever. He said, there are two kinds of suffering. He said, there's the suffering which leads to more suffering, which most people are involved in. It's repetitive cycles looking for the sweet one. And there's the suffering which leads to the end of suffering, which is that seeing, allowing yourself to open to the totality of your experience with love and acceptance and to let your understanding grow from that. We talk about giving up in the retreat. People get afraid. Giving up, what am I going to have to give up? I don't want to give it up yet. Don't understand that surrender, that renunciation is really joyful. It's not hard when you start to see it. It's a lightning. The more that you can let go of, the freer, the more open, the more spacious that your life becomes. When you let go of whatever it is, opinions, possessions, needs to be somebody, self-image. 
not merit, not good deeds, not concentration, not insight, but the sure heart's release. This is truly the aim, the essence of the path of Dharma, said by the Buddha several different times. Coming to that deep understanding that releases, that frees, that can then be shared with another. The extinction of greed, of hatred and delusion, this indeed is called nirvana. And for a disciple thus freed, in whose heart dwells peace, there is nothing to be added to what has been done, and naught more remains for him to do or her to do. Just as a rock of one solid mass remains unshaken by the wind, even so neither forms nor sounds nor odors nor taste nor contact of any kind, neither the desired nor the undesired, can cause such a one to waver. Steadfast is the mind, gained is deliverance. And for one who has considered all the contrasts on this earth, and is no more disturbed by anything whatever in the world, the peaceful one, freed from rage, from sorrow, and from longing, has passed beyond birth and beyond death. Very, very joyful. Joyful in a different way than just happiness. It's the joy of becoming a Buddha. Of seeing that all things arise and pass. Able to be with them in an accepting, loving, compassionate way. Without fear. Without being caught up. It's what the practice is really about. Becoming a bodhisattva. Becoming a Buddha. If you read the tales of the Buddha, his former lives as a bodhisattva, many, many lifetimes of accumulating, of, of accumulating is perhaps not the quite the right word, of cultivating the qualities of compassion and generosity and patience and energy. More and more. He made a lot of mistakes. He had a lot of difficult times too. But underlying it was always this thread of unalterable commitment to the truth, to finding out what this is about, and to compassion, to finding that out not just for himself, but in order to share that with all being. Read you a quote from Einstein. A human being is a part of the whole called universe called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Talk about one last bodhisattva for ending one other inspiring teacher, a man named Kalu Rinpoche, very aged and wise Tibetan lama, who's been in this country at times in the last few years. He still stayed with some friends of mine in Boston. They told me a couple of stories. I arrived just the day after he had left. The house was filled with light. One of them was that they took him to the Boston Aquarium, which is this huge multi-story building filled with all kinds of little tanks of fishes and sea urchins and then a huge tank in the middle with sharks and things in it. And he loved it. He loves aquariums and zoos and animals in general. And they took him around. As he went by each tank that he passed, he would go up to it after looking at the fishes and he would tap on it 
as if to get the attention of the beings inside, and he would say, Om Mani Padme Hum, the Tibetan mantra, to bless those beings that they too should be free, should be liberated. And each being that he met in his life was met in that way. At some point, a women's club, uh, sort of a suburban women's club that was into the occult, her hearing that a famous Tibetan Lama was in town came to pay their respects to him, visit him. And they sat while he spoke to some other people and finally it was their turn to talk to him. And he's supposedly a very great yogi, master of the highest Tibetan practices. And they began to ask him questions like, you know, can you fly? <laughs> no. Can you read our minds now? No. They were getting frustrated. Well, what exactly is it that you do? <laughs> and he said, I simply co practice compassion for every living being. That's one way of summing up the path that we're practicing. You can't practice it for every living being, however, if you don't learn how to feel it, that love, that acceptance, for every, every part of yourself, every being within you. A couple more Kalu stories to end this. He had a disciple, a woman in India who was Canadian and came back to Canada to practice, I believe is a nun. I have the story right. She found it very difficult being back in Canada after having been in India. The work was hard, relations with family, everything was very difficult, the transformation back to this culture, the West. She wrote him a kind of pleading letter saying, everything is going bad, it's all so difficult. The only thing that keeps me going is that I have you in my heart. And he wrote her back a letter of one sentence in reply, which said, the nature of the heart is emptiness. Very great teacher. Not even letting her get caught up in that love, in that, that which she was holding on to. Even love, on many levels, is simply another quality that's going to come and go. The most absolute level, it's the same as the understanding of emptiness of emptiness of self, not emptiness that things aren't here, but that deep understanding which dissolves any sense of you apart from others. After that, he followed it with another letter, however, that was much softer to, after, she, after he took away that which he was holding on to, to free her, he said, when you practice the holy dharma, Slowly the clouds of sorrow will drift away and the sun of wisdom and great joy will be shining in the clear sky of your mind. And I wish you the vision, each of you, to see that, to see that in your own life, to come to your own inner vision of the fullness of what this is about, a really deep way. And I wish you the courage to seek for this vision and to follow it, to let it deepen so that that becomes that which guides your life and transforms it and transforms your relation to all the beings that you meet in this world. Mm -hmm.